It all started on November 21st, 2013, when the Ukrainian government was going to sign a trade and political agreement with the European Union. And uh, it wasn't just the signing of a document, it was supposed to be a step forward to have great opportunities and equal rights and just to have a better standards of living. And unfortunately, the government at that time refused to sign it at the last minute. That caused a war in Ukraine uh, in the end. It was supposed to be a peaceful strike right after not signing the agreement. And uh, just two days later after that, uh, it turned out to be very violent in my capital. Thousands of people stood up because it was supposed to be a step forward. And that government said no, and the people said yes. And uh, unfortunately, the government decided to beat and kill unarmed Ukrainians because they just wanted to stand up for their rights. That was definitely a breaking point in Ukrainian history. Hundreds of people died, and you probably have watched it since last winter. A lot of people died, and you know, the sad part about it is they were unarmed with like sticks and stones fighting with armed government police. It was just uh, no good. Um, and so young people died, and it's just so, so sad. And unfortunately, it was only beginning. That little strike that was supposed to be peaceful, it was only the beginning of what is actually going on right now. At that point, they threw the old government, they put a new president in a new parliament, and uh, it is assumed that the old president fled to Russia, because he always has been uh, a very big supporter of Russia instead of the European Union. After that, the Russian president decided that he is going to help Russian-speaking Ukrainians in Crimea. Uh, it's a little island on the Black Sea, very beautiful, and um, tourism is very popular there. It's a very beautiful place. I've been there. And so Russian president decided that he was going to, I don't know, help Russian-speaking people to stand up uh, against the Ukrainian government. And uh, that caused the uh, annexation of Crimea. To this day, the current uh, Ukrainian government does not accept it. And I'm sure, according to a lot of world laws, we live in 2014, you can't just do that if the government of that country doesn't allow it. So a lot of people today don't accept it, but that's what Russia thinks, that they have that part of Ukrainian land. And I'm sure there are some Ukrainians, Russian Ukrainians speaking, that are happy about it. But millions of Ukrainians are not happy about it. And then there was Slavyansk, it's quite a big city, and it is in eastern Ukraine, uh, I am from eastern Ukraine, and I speak Russian, uh, I speak Russian. If you ask me what side am I for, I'm the side for where there's peace and no violence. <laughs> like, I don't care, Russian Ukraine is just peace, <laughs> violence, and opportunities. Um, but uh, yeah, there was Slavyansk, and the Russian separatists, that's how they call themselves and that's how the world um, calls them. They're just people who want to be part of Russia and uh, get support from Russia, propaganda from Russia. Uh, but yeah, they um, began their propaganda in Slavyansk and eventually there was a lot of fighting with the uh, Ukrainian army. Hundreds and hundreds of people injured and died and the town completely destroyed. They just, uh, for some reason, they just chose that town to be there target. Like as of today, this town is taken back by Ukrainian government, but from what I hear, it's probably on paper and <coughs> on the news. Then after Slavyansk there was Gorlovka in Makievka, that's where I'm from, Makievka. I'm 45 minutes away from Donetsk. Donetsk is the capital of Donetsk state. Uh, in my country it's like the name of the capital is the actual name of the state as well. Kisinabata, Shakhtyorsk, all this little town around the capital began to be their target as well. And it's like you watch the news and you would hear shooting there, bombing there, you know, just just fighting there. And unfortunately, it's happening to this day. Everything is going on in the capital of Donetsk state. This is supposed to be the capital of Donetsk Russian Republic. 
That's how they decided to call it. So these Russian savages, they took like just you know a couple of states of my country and they decided to make them totally independent and they decided to call it all the Nilsk Russian Republic. Do all civilians like it? No. But of course there are some supporters. So it's very divided. Very divided. But the thing is, I always think, okay, so there is this misunderstanding and division in opinions, but don't do violence, but it's still going on. Don't forget the Malaysian airplane. It just happened to fly over Ukraine at their own time, in their own place. And 250 people, 250 innocent people, which is blown up in the air, and they never even made it to the ground. Um, it's sad. You know, people, some people think it's Russia, some people think it's Ukraine who did it. But I can assure you, being from a lot of people consider a third world country, that Ukraine does not have the means, that equipment, that can blow up such a huge airplane in such a far distance. To this day, all this violence continues. I believe it's because of amazing propaganda. Around 4,000 people injured and thousand killed. Mothers, wives, sisters, and kids. Is a Russian separatist or Ukrainians are hurting? Young boys get killed. I'm telling you, 20 years old, young boy went to serve this country and killed for, for just protecting the country from Russian cemeteries. Like to me, it almost doesn't make sense because I am part Russian. Like my mother is Russian, I speak Russian, and now the country that's supposed to be a sister country is doing this and it, it just like doesn't make any sense. Houses, museums, city halls, kindergartens, schools get destroyed for nothing. And I'm sure everyone the questions, when will this end? And then one day too, every day, every day I go to contact you. It's like uh, Russian Facebook. It looks identical to like Facebook, but it's Russian. It's very popular among Russian speaking people. And I read these updates on what is going on in my home state. I see violent pictures and violent videos every day. But I can't post them on my American Facebook. Like, I have a piece that's for Ukraine, and if I would definitely ask you please like it on Facebook. I keep writing updates. What I see on Kontakti, you know, I write what I see. I, would, I mean, something blew up or some of the guys shot or that, like what I see and I write. But I never post the pictures and the videos because how disturbing they are. Imagine blood and dead bodies. You just go home. And in my country, it's not like it's cars all the time, you know, you're in the car. No, you're walking home, you're walking home, dead body, dead I mean, it's just disturbing. And so that's why I don't post them on Facebook because. I didn't want to get banned from Facebook because when you read terms and conditions it says no violence and it would be very violent. Although, I don't know how it even lets me to post what I do post because I just, you know, I just say the facts but they are not, you know, they, they're not nice facts. You know, people lose their arms and legs and eyes and I just, I mean, we live in 2014 and that's what I don't understand. Unfortunately, people get lost and they can't be found. You know, children get lost and men get lost, and that's another aspect of the war. Girls get raped, and I am a girl, and to me, I can't, I can't explain this. People will become homeless because bombs and ultra shells fall on their houses, and it's like winter is coming in my country. It can get into even minus 13 Fahrenheit and it's freezing and now they don't know they have their homes and they have no way to turn and all they have left is mercy of God and mercy of those people who can possibly take them. Okay, and I mean you can google Ukrainian houses war, I mean you'll see those destruction pictures that I don't dare to post on American Facebook because it's disturbing. As I've watched what was happening in Ukraine, of course I felt for it and I cried, especially in the beginning I would talk to my mother on the phone and I cried. And I knew it was bad. I knew it was horrible. But I never knew how bad it was till it affected my family. If I start crying. Well, on September 16th, 
2014, my brother was on the bus. My brother is uh, 28 years old, a year older than me. He was on the bus and um, he was going from one state to another state. And uh, he was on the border of Donetsk, where everything was going on. He was just visiting my mother and he was going home to check on the house because he knew that houses get destroyed and he just wanted to to see if the house is still there, which is, I think, not smart in there. He should have gone there at all because it's a war zone. They stopped the bus, uh, eight soldiers. I can't tell you what they were, who they were. And so, yeah, they, they chose several people on their bus and they just beat them up, eight people on one person with batons. They even turned off the phone when they were doing it. Smart. And they, uh, of course, they beat uh, nearly to death, they stole the money, they, um, um, and they uh, threw him just at the edge of the road and left. He was down the road, nearly dead, you know, in blood, and the arm cut open. Um, and it was good that, you know, the, the drivers were passing by, and it was good that there was one driver that they just stopped blessing and it took him home because if not that I don't know how he would get home he would just die with the edge of the road <laughs> and the scene is, is that like they when they took the money the guy just found and then the, his phone was a uh, old model and he was begging them at least give the phone back after they stopped and uh, because the phone was old as I said they gave the phone back so that was good place he could have called I guess my mother but even if he would call like he's at on the road and she's not a state and I don't know it's just a god thing that uh, you know somebody just took him home and I, I question to this day why um, he didn't take him to the hospital but I probably know that my brother probably just wanted to go home be by himself and he of course didn't have the money to go to the hospital maybe that will stop him I don't know the good news is that my mother did not tell me about it on the day that it happened. It happened on Tuesday and I'm sure if she told me when that happened I would not make it at work <laughs> there. <laughs> because, um, you know, I just I wouldn't make it the next day. I, I, I don't know, I'm angry, I'm sad, I, I don't know. Well, she told me that on Saturday. And I know that uh, my brother, unfortunately, one of the most lonely people you would ever meet. And people who could help him already left the town. A lot of people leave towns there because it's horrible to live there. You know, the shops closed and houses get destroyed and the banks don't work. They have only one bank that's working, huge lines. And so, yeah, and I mean, I wanted to find a way to help even I'm here. And I started contacting every American I've ever known, I've ever worked for. I used to be a translator for American missionaries. That's what kind of brought me here. But and so, yeah, I contacted this lady. She gave me this contact of this man. I'm going to give it to I. I called him Saturday, you know, 11 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock in the morning, my time, Ukrainian time. And he said, pray about it. I'm going to go check on him on Sunday. And he turned out to be prison minister. And he checked my brother. Like good Samaritan. You know what I mean? Like, really, I was, I, I just, it, was it was God. And I know that so many people prayed when I posted this on Facebook. My car was praying. People at church is spread, and I feel like it's just God answered because this man did come check my brother, rebandage him, like good Samaritan in the Bible. But what I can tell you is that my brother is an atheist. And I hope that through this horror he will become a Christian because this man is a Christian, came check on him, and he came, you know, knock my brother's door, and of course he. Didn't expect anybody, and he asked him this question, saying that, "Well, I didn't tell anybody I was hurt. You're probably from God." So he has already questioned it. So I'm hoping there will be blessing in disguise that he will become Christian through this. You know, so I'm really looking forward to it. But yeah, this is how it affected my family, and that's why I became even more aware of what it's like to go through war, and that's why I want to help my country. I started this ministry. My mother, she makes these peace dots, and I have only one left because, you know, it takes a long time to make it. 
and then it takes her two weeks for it to get here and then she sent me 10 once and then 16 second time well I had to keep two so I had only 14 and then give them up see and I have like one I just this person at church I didn't give it to her yet but yeah you can look and she makes them all handcrafted but I want to tell you how um, it all started it was inspired by this story of Sadako Sasaki, or oh, that's how you say it, I don't know. It's a Japanese girl, and maybe some of you have heard this story. And during the Second World War, when the bomb fell in Hiroshima, <coughs> this girl, she believed if she distributed a thousand paper cranes, she will not die. And you can go to Japanese girl paper cranes, it will be all, and they will, she's even on Wikipedia, but she distributed only 644 and unfortunately she died. But of course it's not exactly what will really, but it's kind of a cool story. Like if we distribute a thousand peace dust, there will be peace in Ukraine. I don't know. But it's just kind of, it's all inspired that way. I always say five dollars or more because it's our, you know, way to fundraise. And uh, we fundraised uh, 230 dollars. You know, it's not much, but I hope, you know, God is going to take care about this and I know it's going for a good cost but that's how a little way and I know that if you get one you know you remember that it's like you ambassador of peace the proceeds from peace dust for Ukraine would go to medical supplies food and clothes and possibly shelter to Ukraine <coughs> I really thank you ladies so much for letting me be here and hear my story and I want to pray Dear Lord, thank you so much for letting me be here and sharing um, the story about Ukraine and my family's story with these wonderful ladies. I pray for their ministry, whatever they do, give them strength and watch over them and take care about their families, please. I pray for Ukraine that you will stop the war, stop the killing and dying of those innocent people. And I want to pray for peace stops. Please use me and please use everybody who wants to get involved in this. Please take care about this ministry and use it for good to help Ukraine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.